All right, so welcome back. And then this next panel features bio and healthcare investors from Andreessen Horowitz, Coastal Ventures, and Venrock. They are some of the most respected firms out there. So before we bring them up on stage, um, I wanted to introduce you to our moderator, Ethan Perlstein. So Ethan is a YC alum, and he's a founder and CEO of Perlara. Perlara was the very first bio public benefit corporation. They focus on helping families find cures for rare diseases. He's also co-founder and CEO of Maggie's Pearl, which is a clinical stage joint venture that is currently sponsoring a phase three clinical trial at the Mayo Clinic. He is also an active seed investor himself. So I would like to introduce Ethan, Camille, Vanita, and Morgan. Welcome. You can go next. All right, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to have this responsibility to moderate this great panel. So everyone's settled in here. So I'd like for our distinguished guests to introduce themselves. So maybe we'll just start um, in the sequence here. Cami sitting next to me. Please go first. Hi, guys. It's Cami Samuels, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be up here talking to you. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself as a human first, a little bit about Venrock, and then a little bit about my v approach to venture. As a human, what I think is relevant is first, I grew up in New York City, but have lived in San Francisco forever, and I'm now dyed in the wool Californian. But I, um, I lost both my parents at a young age to the biggies, one cancer and one heart disease. I have a son with autism, and I myself have a rare disease. So healthcare is deeply personal for me, so don't just look at what I say through the lens of cynical venture capitalists. Please look at, at someone who really wants to get products to patients. Um, Venrock has been around since the late 1960s. It's one of the original venture firms. We have, right now, about six billion under management. Um, we were lucky enough to be a part of some of the earliest companies in biotech, like Biogenetic and Gilead, and then on through Illumina and 10X Genomics and so on. Um, and I feel like I'm very much standing on the shoulders of giants working at Venarc. Um, I myself am most in love with just complete unmet medical needs. Um, so I do a lot of orphan disease investing, but just um, diseases for which there aren't great therapies. I major in therapeutics, I minor in consumer health, and in uh, medical devices. Thank you. And Vanita, representing the notorious A16Z. Thank you, Ethan. I was waiting for how much shade there would be on this panel from Ethan. <laughs> that was a compliment. <laughs> um, well, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Sorby, for inviting us all here to, to get to meet some of you. Um, my name is Vinny Tagarwal. I'm one of the investing partners at Andreessen Horowitz, um, part of our biohealth fund team. And so similar to what you heard Sorby describe <clears throat> um, for YC, we love that structure. We love the idea of dedicated teams and you know resources and, and people, really, to help um, uh, great founders in the space like yourselves build companies in, in very special areas. Um, I, uh, I'm a physician by background, so I echo, echo what you said about um, being super, super patient focused and ultimately everything that, um, that we back, we hope has a transformative impact on patient lives. Um, and we share a lot of the DNA that YC brings to you all um, and that, you know, for both prospective and current YC founders, our, our firm was founded by technical founders. That's, that's our mission as well. Um, and so it's, it's really exciting to be here and we look forward to, to working together. And Alex. I thank you uh, also for having me. And it's nice to see a lot of my portfolio companies or our firm's portfolio companies in the audience, including some that have already exited, which is fantastic. Um, the firm, Coastal Ventures, as probably many of you know, broadly invests in everything from consumer technologies, consumer food tech, things like Impossible Foods, all the way through to aerospace, companies like Rocket Lab, but also companies like DoorDash and GitLab and all kinds of things. Um, but I lead our health and bio investing practice, and for us, that's everything from healthcare services, AI radiology, um, drug discovery platforms, deployed healthcare, digital health, and some devices. 
Um, and I'm, by personal background, I'm originally a physician scientist. I was an AI researcher and then kind of moved into biomedicine. Um, but I've been at Coastal Ventures for seven years now. Fantastic. So let's dive right in and we'll just sort of continue that order. Maybe Cam, even you to Alex as we go through these questions. And if you have nothing to add or um, we can, we can of course, you don't have to speak. Uh, we can go uh, to the next person and then go to the next question. So first, uh, first up, so what do you look for in an early stage deal? Anything specific about the entrepreneur, the company itself? Uh, do you have a certain investment thesis? Sure. So I already hinted about unmet medical need. I don't, early stage technical founders tend to um, emphasize near-term risk and de-emphasize long-term risk. I don't love investing in a big commercial scrum 15 years from now, right? <laughs> so, um, so I'd rather take on a meaty technical risk, um, looking to de-risk it relatively early in the investment cycle. Um, I, you know, everyone says they back great people, um, big markets, um, orthogonal and hard technology. Um, on the people side, one, th I want to say something like vague that may be unexpected. Truth seeking is a quality I look for in entrepreneurs. Um, and it, it emerges often in the first and second meeting. And what I mean by that is um, nothing's perfect. Your deal inevitably has warts. Um, are you seeing them? trying to address them, admitting that you don't know how to address it, looking for help, um, all that. Because if you are trying to shove it under the rug, which is a natural human instinct, then I won't be able to help you, and I'm worried about the, the risks that w we're not identifying. Um, so that's a quality that you may not hear about all the time that means a lot to me as an investor. Um, my very first investment at Andreessen Horowitz was in a YC company, I think Manav is here somewhere, but I invested in Memora Health. And I often look back to, um, to the founder qualities, to your question, Ethan, that, that got us excited about an investment like that. And we often talk about um, a sort of a trope in venture, but maybe you've heard it before and I thought maybe it'd be helpful to explain, which is something called the idea maze. And I think it might, it sort of, it gets used in this way without people describing what it means and it sounds, it sounds, um, you know, confusing, but really it's, it's we like to figure out, can we be on an intellectual journey with someone and what does that feel like? And at the earliest stages of company building, most of what you think is going to happen is not going to happen. Um, and I think that's just important to be, as Cami said, honest about and upfront about and be okay with, actually. It's really important for us to know that a founder is okay if hypothesis X didn't work out, because we don't expect it to work out either all the time. Sometimes it does, sometimes, you know, I think you heard a phenomenal story from the Asher Bio founders, and Ivana told just a beautiful story of, of some things really working out um, as intended with really great plans, but that doesn't always happen. And so if it doesn't happen, we like asking questions about, you know, what if? What if this doesn't happen? What if this customer doesn't bite? What if this science doesn't pan out? What if, you know, you spend this much capital on, on this experiment? What would you do next as your next experiment? These are all questions that we, we call navigating the idea maze. And a lot of that is intellectual horsepower, but a lot of it is personality and <clears throat> your willingness to be collaborative with, with an investor and, and bring us along for the ride, right? You're always going to know more about your science and your space and your technology than we ever will. But we want to be able to, to share a little bit of what we've learned from pattern matching across a lot of companies and founders. And from time to time, that's a journey that we think will be fun to take together. And so... Um, I think that's actually probably the number one thing I look for is, is do I feel like it would be really fun to navigate the company building journey um, with you? So I think, as Cami said first, most everyone would say at a, in principle, everyone's looking for a strong, differentiated team. You know, are the, is this the best possible team working for this problem? Is there a fit to purpose? You know, is this a big enough market opportunity? Because if it's a big enough market opportunity, you can screw up a little bit, which is great for an early stage company and still find your place. If, you, if it's a narrow opportunity where you really have to thread many needles to get there, that can be hard. Um, but I think one of the things that may be worth just jumping to, I think, 
maybe the elephant in the room that was sort of alluded to in the, in the partnering session is that I think more than ever, there, especially for an early stage deep tech company, there is a lot of future financing risk. And as I'm looking at companies now, one of the big questions I have is where, what do I think about the future financing risk of this company? And a lot of that hinges on something Vanita and Kimmy both were kind of talking about is, does this company have full clarity into, my, into our weaknesses and is very intellectually honest about the, the, this process that I'm gonna, you know, that, that I as an entrepreneur and my team are gonna have to navigate um, and not have unrealistic expectations? I hear a lot of companies, and I've, uh, you know, I don't, many of you in the audience here at favorite times, I've heard talk about how everything in your company is great. The team you have in, per, in place is the exact one you'll ever need. It's not true I, in most cases, right? I mean, you're, you're going to evolve your company, and you have to know what the holes are, what your weaknesses are, and lean into them. Otherwise, it's very hard to address them. And, you know, other things that I also look for, especially in this environment where you're gonna need a very strong team to navigate the, the journey ahead, is we'll often see teams say, oh, I just need to hire a couple techs, so I don't need a big option pool. That's, I don't think, the right way to frame an early stage company that it needs to bring on excellent talent. So success as an early stage company is a consolidation of amazing talent trying to do the impossible. And you really are about consolidating that group to overcome the challenges you have, because in an early stage company, you're half-baked or even like one-tenth baked. So you can't assume that everything's perfect. Can I just build on that, Ethan? Please, Sorry. Please. Um, so part of this truth-seeking is accepting the financing environment that you're in and having the mental fluidity to adjust, right? So for, call it five years, we've been in the land of Bacchanalia, and the right business model might have been to boil the ocean. Um, today, people need to see you make progress typically towards the clinic, um, with at least one program that folks understand where it lives. Um, the, and obviously that's a therapeutic specific example, but um, breadth versus depth is a real trade-off you have to make, and the right business model also has to fit the right moment. You may, I'm not asking you, we're not asking you to uh, eliminate all your dreams. Um, you just may need to Step, in a stepwise fashion, wait until your valuation's higher, i.e. the capital's cheaper, um, until you do everything you want to do. Um, and that's an example of, um, of something we're looking to see, that you're sort of, your antenna are up, you've adjusted, and again, dream all you want, I want to dream right there with you, but also adjust. So yeah, I'm glad you brought this up because I was going to get to this the question of the current funding climate. I'm sure there are folks who are fundraising or have been fundraising since the early, when sort of the music stopped earlier the year. So do you want to amplify anything on that point about what entrepreneurs should be thinking about it to survive this, this winter? Um, you want to continue and then we'll go to... Uh, yeah, line. so um, I actually had an associate come sit in my room depressed on Monday. So a young guy who thought he was going to like make his first investment last week and, and, you know, make partner um, next year. Um, and he was just so bummed about the environment that he's in. And I honestly started my venture career a long time ago in a uh, first in a boom that went into a downturn within a, in a year. Um, and I actually think it's, it's, you know, you've heard the, the trope that what the best companies are created during a downturn. I actually think, um, there's a risk that we as VCs or we as entrepreneurs act like Pali high school adolescents if we only live in great times. And, and learning that not everybody has a Tesla at 16 is actually a really good thing. Um, so you do have to be clever. Um, so strategics might become more important. You know, strategy is about making choices. One of my... my saucy sayings is, last time I checked, it wasn't luxury as the motherhood of invention, it was necessity. So, so take, take this moment and say, all right, this is what makes for the difference between a good entrepreneur and a not so good entrepreneur is figuring it out. So maybe it's, you know, waiting for three years to work on a third program, or maybe it's, um, as Ivana said, you know, doing that animal model a little on the come 
because it'll validate us for the next investing round, whatever it is, but show progress. And if you need to partner one of your babies and all your drugs will feel like babies, they do to me as well, you might have to. I think I would echo what Alex said, is just be thinking ahead about the next rounds. So one of the things that's challenging in this environment is that pre-seed seed has not corrected as much as A and B, and I just think that's a harsh reality that we all have to figure out together. Everyone on this panel actually does a lot of seed investing, something like 70% of the dollars that we invest out of the biohealth fund at, at A16Z is actually first money in, so it's not like we're not right there with you. At that point, your seed investors are in the same boat as you, and you have to figure out how to navigate the future financings together. Um, <clears throat> but the correction is different at different stages, and so that's just something that, you know, I think work with investors that, you know, just as you're, they're picking you, you're picking them. And hopefully, you know, you can navigate that collaboratively as you move forward. But it's never been more important to, at the time of your seed financing, be working backwards from your Series A financing and at every step of the way have that kind of, a, that kind of an approach to it. That's not to say, you know, sometimes you're, you know, sometimes you might be discharging something that feels like existential risk on the seed, and that's why, you know, you got, you're really fortunate to have people betting on you at that stage, and you may think, well, I just can't predict past that. You know, I don't know if this is going to work. If it doesn't work, I might have to do a 180, sure. But try to think through, okay, if this does work, here's where we're headed next. Here's what we'd have to fundraise to. I often tell um, seed founders to make their Series A deck. Have it be empty slides, but use it as a way to think through what milestones are going to be really attractive to a Series A investor and record some of the feedback you heard from multi-stage funds and funds that could be um, investor partners for you at, at future stages. Alex, any thought about the downturn or the current climate? Uh, yeah, I mean, we could keep talking, to it, but maybe we won't talk about something more uplifting for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So well, maybe we'll do a little we're twist all, we're here. All doom and gloom. Yeah, no, no, okay, no, no more doom and gloom. So YC always YC always tells their founders not to get too discouraged by no's from investors that investors make mistakes. Can you tell us about a miss that you've had? I'm going to tell one that's really in the Venrock family. So um, uh, I did a lot of work on investment on a company called Avexis. Um, I was doing it supporting uh, one of my uh, late stage investment partners, Bong Co. Um, and Avexis ultimately got acquired by Novartis for, I think it was $9 billion. And, um, and the round that Bong invested in, it was the first institutional round, but Roche had gone in there prior, so it was the first VC round, um, was like at 120 million pre. So I did a bunch of work on it. It had a cop from Long Island as its CEO, um, and it had twin sisters doing all the sort of RA work, and that was it. So it violated sort of every stereotype of like what VCs are supposed to invest in. And so I ended up kind of copping out um, and being like, too expensive, doesn't have the right CEO, not gonna invest. Now I got carry in the public fund because I helped doing the work, but I didn't put the early stage funds money in it saying it was too expensive and it ended up being a really nice outcome. And I will have to say, so the disease SMA kills children at 14 months old and they have before and after videos for Avexis and there's not a dry eye in the house. So here I am, the person who wants to really make an impact on, on kids in particular and I miss the boat. There are too many, mo any, <laughs> any honest investor will tell you there are too many misses to name. Like a no does not mean that it was kind of the most thought out correct answer. They empirically are, like it has to be false, right? That most of the no's um, are false because many of you will succeed in extraordinary ways. So that's just, I think the spirit behind your question was, you know, how do I interpret a no? And it absolutely, it basically doesn't, the binary doesn't mean much. I think what's worth paying attention to are, you know, people's thoughts on what made them hesitate and what might be actionable advice. Even that, I would say a lot of it is probably not actionable because, again, we don't understand your businesses as well as you do. Um, <clears throat> I'll give, um, 
I won't say, I didn't tell Sorby I would tell her about this, but I would say this, but I missed Sorby's first um, couple of financings at her company. Um, it was a phenomenal med device product. I was super excited about it. Sorby passed all the idea maze tests and everything that one could possibly put into, um, put into a diligence process. Um, but at the time, our fund, um, I was at another fund and we didn't do med device. And so sometimes just remember that your investors have certain mandates with their LPs and certain, you know, kind of areas in which they plan to or, you know, think that they want to invest and it might just not align with where you are, but sometimes that can still mean that you become friends with them and <laughs> spend and, you know, and hopefully work together in, in lots of ways. So I think um, that's, it, it is, a, I think that's a good example of um, where keeping in touch can, can really be great from a, at a personal level even. If you connect with folks who get to a no, don't take that grudgingly, just recognize that they have some of their own constraints. And then another example I'll share since I'm on a panel with Alex is um, a DNA sequencing company called Ultima that Kosla was in very, very early. <clears throat> I finally, after many years of trying to invest in this company, um, uh, we came in via our growth fund at Andreessen Horowitz. We're incredibly excited to back the company, but you know that was a really, really different technology. And so I think you can't expect every investor at every stage to get it and be right there with you on seeing the potential for a technology. In the DNA sequencing space in particular, there are a lot of um, what investors call dead bodies. There are a lot of companies that didn't make it. And so having awareness about why that is the case, having an explanation for why that might be the case and why you might be different and what your unfair advantage is can really help combat um, the biases that some investors will bring you know, to those decisions and guilty myself of, of having those biases. See, it happens to the best of us. Alex? Like one that, that I think is strikes all I always think about is recursion because we saw that right when it was coming out in the seed stage it was right in my strike zone thought it was very interesting easy for me to evaluate one that I knew you know the space really well but my partners really had had poor experiences building complex companies like that in in let's say unusual ecosystems and there was a lot of skepticism that they would bring in the you know the there also there was like even more even though we may think now that the fight for AI talent is hard, there were just fewer people coming out of school and everything at the time. So would they get the AI talent that they needed and the biopharma talent to move to Salt Lake City? And that was the reason we passed. And, and I've sort of like, I think I was maybe too weak-willed or something to fight against my partners and say, yes, I think they can do it. And now in a post-COVID world, I think it would be it's a little silly to think you could only build companies in certain areas. But at the time, there was a lot of bias. Uh, on, and that was, that was something that was going to require a lot of on-prem, and they have a huge facility now. So that's one. I was just looking in my email on our notes on Asher. And <laughs> Vinod Kosla and I are emailing back when it was a YC company, I guess, in the whatever batch in 19. And we were both like, this looks really interesting. Vinod's like, yeah, I could easily be a one on this. This seems really cool. And there's a lot of back and forth. They're like, well, there's a lot of activity in the space. We are not experts in the area that they're doing. But there are, you know, we, we did a little quick background of how many companies and how many drugs there were in the space. And we're just like, we don't know enough to feel competent. We're not the ones to be the... We didn't feel like this was an area of our expertise, and you know, so we missed out, I guess. The company seems like it's doing great, and it's a good company. Awesome, so let's now go from the other tack. So when you get really excited about a company, can you share with us uh, what happens behind the scenes a little? What happens in those Monday partner meetings? Um, can you talk about diligence process, or how, how do you gauge your partnership when you're trying to, uh, when you're the one who's sort of bringing the deal to the, to the partnership? Do you want to start this time? I feel yeah, we can mix it up. You're, Alex, you start? you're always last. No, um, I guess, you know, one important thing to remember, of course, is that it varies. If you do different stages of investing or different types of investing, it can actually vary tremendously. So, you know, many of the early stage coming right out of YC, companies raising a couple million dollars in an area that we already feel like we know something or we're just kind of doing a small seed investment, that can be a very quick decision-making process all the way through to we have SPACs and do SPAC mergers and $250 million deals, which as you may imagine, requires a lot of work uh, over months sometimes. So there's a huge spectrum um, and there are also different styles of companies. So deep tech companies where we have to do a lot of IP work, that is a whole different process. And we actually recently hired a full-time JDMD uh, IP attorney to help us do diligence in particularly bio, bio and healthcare related IP questions. So it, 
I want to give you a, it's hard for me to give a simple answer because there are so many different styles of companies that require different kinds of questions. And like I said, an early seed stage company, there's often not a whole lot of their due diligence and it may just be we have some thoughts about the founders and roughly the problem they're working on all the way through to like very serious metrics about you know, very sub-cohort analysis in particular growth in different markets and time to pay back in different kind of CapEx investments that take a lot longer. Any, uh, Vanita? Uh, no, I, I was gonna say I agree that there's dramatic diversity in the, <clears throat> in the process. I think um, most venture partnerships, even though they seem large, like ultimately you're gonna converge on one or two people who are gonna spend the most time with you and, um, and, and really kind of ultimately advocate for an investment. And, you know, I think sometimes venture partnerships feel large or you feel like you have to convince a lot of people or at a partner meeting you're worried you didn't get in front of everybody. This is a human business. Like, ultimately, you're, you're going to get to know a couple of people who shepherd you through and to whom you should be able to ask um, questions and they'll ask you back questions. And so I, th I think that's just one thing I'll point out is that Partner meetings at, at most of our funds are an opportunity for us to collect input from our full partnership, but ultimately it's always going to be one or two people who hopefully go deep with you on, on the idea that you're bringing to the table. For me, the biggest thing I look for at seed stage um, uh, is, what to the discussion before, kind of plan for the next fundraise, ironically enough. Um, it's a question that comes up across our partnership very, very early. And... Um, and sort of unfair advantage, right? Like a simple answer to the question, why is this company unfairly positioned to win in the space that they're talking about going after? Sometimes that can be as simple as the people, and sometimes it's something really, really technical. It's a creative assay that they've invented. It's the ability to do more with less capital and screen something, screen a very large space, for example, to, to learn some SAR insights in a very short amount of time. But I gotta have a quick answer, actually, to that question um, to, to feel comfortable at seed stage. It's like, why do you wanna be president? You have to know that one. So everything we do is geeky tech. I don't say deep tech, I just say geeky. So when even on the tech side, um, all of our companies are geeky. Um, so we generally don't participate in the like consumer VC one week to term sheet process. Um, and um, so we, we tend to take two, two to three months getting to know a company. I'm sorry, I know that sucks, but we do. Um, and there are just a, a one or two or at most three people doing deep diligence. Um, and then the process at Venerac, I can't hide behind my partners when I pass because I could be the only person in the partnership that loves a deal and I could do it. So some, I, prior to Venerac, I was a managing director at Versant Ventures and at Versant, it was a group decision. Um, I could do, and we have actually had really nice outcome deals where the rest of the firm functionally vomited on it. So, <laughs> um, so every firm has its own culture and style. Venture firms are like marriages. You have no idea what's going on inside them unless you're inside them. Um, so ex expect a different process in each firm. If you've got a deep tech, most of you do. Um, it's not going to be an overnight process, and particularly in a, in a financing environment like this. All right, maybe let's get uh, let's return to the saucy questions. So, um, where do you? I'll, I'll make it saucy, even if it's not saucy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where do you situate yourself on the biotech tech bio continuum? Um, and you could reject the assumption or the premise of the question, um, but I know that you know this is a the founder led bio movement or the tech bio movement is is, is marketing itself and branding itself as different from biotech. So I guess how do you see yourself in this? We should, we should ask you to answer that one first, Ethan. Ooh. <laughs> Where do I see you guys? I need a definition. Oh boy. It's like a spelling bee. May I have the <laughs> definition, please? Well, we know what biotech means, right? I guess, right? Traditional life science investors. Uh, do, we, do we agree on what that means? And that's, you know, that's, you know biotech is shorthand for that. Um, and I guess tech bio is, I don't really, really know. Use it it but does biotech include genomics? Sure. Okay, so <laughs> tools, tools are in biotech in your mind. Absolutely. Different people don't include. I do. Not just, I'm, just, just a, I'm not just a therapeutic snob. Yep. Yeah. 
And then tech biotech means like I mean, AI I, and biotech? I, yeah, that's, that's definitely a strain. I mean, I, I identify more with the operational side of it. Like it's, it's more about the founder led and the profile, like the, 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 the PG thesis. But, but yeah, I mean, yeah. I know it means, so, I don't want to get into a whole debate about AI and ML, but. Uh, yeah. So, so my sense is that there are a lot of things that have been confounded in these spectrums of founder led, not founder led, tech, bio, biotech. Like at the end of the day, I think you know Sorby said it well on on her in her discussion. You know, these are all of the companies in this space do converge on a very special regulatory pathway and a very special set of constraints that that the world uses at some level to decide whether or not the thing is working. Um, and so as a result. My feeling is I reject the dichotomy. <laughs> I humbly reject the dichotomy. I mean, I think you know founders are important for every company. Show me a company where the founder didn't matter. The founder could be a senior management you know executive, or the founder could be somebody who just finished their PhD in a lab. We've got we've got all in our portfolio, and they always Many matter. CEOs. The one too, thing that's way. clear is that the founder always matters. Um, and so I, I think that's a that's a shared theme. I think you know kind of. Um, someone mentioned the great blog post on you know why YC Bio and what might be different about funding biotech companies in a more tech way, and that references potentially a lower amount of capital required to stand up a company. I think that's interesting, right? There, that there's something to that, and I think some companies will have a certain set of achievements maybe that are possible, that are tech enabled, that may be more capital efficient than a traditional biotech regime. Maybe, maybe others won't, that are still really exciting companies working towards therapeutics. Daphne Kohler in our portfolio often says, you know, machine learning is going to become something like a computer. It will be impossible to say, I'm a company and I like refuse to use the technologies and the tools that are available. And like that's how I feel about technology. That doesn't have to be your the first three words of your pitch, but it'd be kind of crazy if you refused to apply novel analytic regimes to the data you are collecting. And that's why every large pharma company is talking about that too. So so I reject. <laughs> Noted. Cami? Yeah, I I, I think his Historically, the, the traditional biotech VC put a little too much emphasis on experience in hiring CEOs, and maybe that's why you create that t dichotomy, but we, we are known for founder VC CEOs, as an example, even though, and then, you know, we were the first investors in Illumina and have this long history in doing, um, so I think that as long as genomics and tools are under biotech, and, and, Don't and shoot we're, the messenger. I'm we're, just... we're deep in healthcare IT as well, right? Then honestly, the, what we're looking for and how we support these companies in any way we can looks exactly the same. Any thoughts, Alex? Or... <laughs> Pluto, a planet? I don't know. Um, <laughs> is an $800 million arch-led initial financing a seed round? I, you know, some of these things, it's like very hard. I mean, we're investing in fundamentals and companies and the team in place and the market they're in. It is, by the way, I do think, what is AI is a whole other separate like thing. Um, I do think it Pluto. is important. <laughs> it is actually, although, let me step back. It is pretty important. I think where it's most important is in the later stages when you're dealing with investment bankers and analysts, and they're trying to put you into sector buckets. And there are some very substantial differences and very important branding that you may want for your company at that stage, more so than now at the seed stage. And you're, what you think your company is and what brand you use for it now may evolve and you may, may, you may have strategic reasons for how you position the, the, your company three or four years from now when you are trying to talk to investment bankers and they're gonna put you in a report and try to look for comps in your sector then it's actually pretty, I think it's more important than it is probably now. Maybe we can get do you agree? I don't know, I guess, do you agree? Yeah, I... Keep going, keep going. I think that um, how you describe yourself should, even if you're in deep tech, should speak to investors' hearts, not just their minds, um, and you need to journey through the gunk of understanding what your business is and get to the simplicity on the other side of complexity, and it may change, right? So you may define yourself as an AI company today, and by the time you go public, um, you may be an immunology company. Um, but uh, to the extent that investors are lazy, and many of us are, 
it's helpful to be able to categorize you. So maybe we can go back to just some brass tacks fundraising questions. So given the current climate or looking ahead, what are the sort of milestones you're looking for for a seed stage company and for the A round, for the B? And you don't all have to answer if, uh, if one of you thinks you can kind of consolidate the, the current zeitgeist. I'll tell you what we look for in our companies when we build them. Um, if it's a therapeutics company, we look for usually de-risking on whatever the key risk is, because our companies are usually platform therapeutics companies. Um, we usually look for some animal data, even if this isn't the final drug that's gonna go into patients. Um, ideally, we get to development candidate, but that's rare. Um, but the most important thing is, my ass will be in your conference room at a whiteboard helping you prioritize indications, because um, we really want you to to not only be boiling the ocean, but figure out how you're gonna apply it. Um, in our healthcare IT companies and genomics companies, it's a little bit, there's a little bit of nuance on that. There's usually one fundamental risk that we need to de-risk. In healthcare IT, maybe we need a payer customer already. Yeah, I think the round sizes are so variable that it's hard now to, to say what a seed A or B milestone specifically is, but I think the mindset that I'd encourage is that every round is about discharging risk. Risk is, you know, inversely proportional to price, and that's just how, that's how fundraising, that's the momentum and that's the wheel of fundraising, is that every single round, you have to be laser focused on discharging some risk. That risk could be that, that you can hire somebody. Um, that risk could be something about your technology, but every single round, that's kind of the steady march and drumbeat that I find it's really helpful if, if founders are, are very acutely aware of. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. We invested in Scribe Therapeutics, a really phenomenal founder who came out of Jennifer Doudna's lab, Ben Oaks, and he started the company in his last year of grad school. Um, and so at the time, it was, it was just him, right? So the first round of financing, a big risk that he discharged was, can he stand up a company? Can he hire people who know more than he does about building a therapeutic? And can he validate the core enzyme that he, built, he ultimately is building a company around. The next round of financing required more de-risking. Can you deliver that thing? Can you get to in vivo data? Can you get to you know, all these other proof points? But a steady march towards you know, risk uh, discharging um, helps you raise future rounds. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing for you all to think about is what is your value creating milestone? And also clear ownership in your own mind that you own the value creating step, right? That it's, that there is a, something that you're trying to achieve. And it is sometimes nice in very early seed if there is a clear failure point. Because if it's a failure point, then you're like, okay, well, let's, let's just embrace that, go and do something else. And not kind of be stuck on this path where things haven't quite failed, but they aren't quite succeeding. That's sort of the most painful place to be in. So last question, everyone says they're a platform company. Uh, what truly defines a platform in an era when new modalities are being discovered seemingly at an ever faster rate? I mean, it's not just David Lou's lab that is publishing a new thing every week in nature. Like, that just seems to be, an, that's just a secular trend. So maybe we'll leave with that, maybe more philosophical question. And anyone, this is now the free-for-all round. <laughs> All right, sure, I'll start. So I have a lot of empathy for kind of this feeling that you almost get penalized once your platform lays an egg. And so I just want to acknowledge that I think it's a spectrum and it's hard to know exactly what is a platform versus a product company. And the whole point of a platform company is to make products. And, you know, but what if you found a product that was too good to, to leave on the table, but it didn't come exactly from your platform. And so I just think this goes, for me, it goes back to that idea maze. Help us understand if you do have a product, how you get to the next product. If you don't have a product, how does your platform help you get to that first product? Um, help us understand what, <clears throat> what your special sauce is. Is it target identification? Is it uncovering new biology? Is it creating a modality with a novel mechanism of action? Gosh, there's really few of those. How many therapies do we all know of that have a completely novel mechanism of action? Any of that you know, I think we have a pretty loose definition of a platform, um, as long as we can see line of sight to what comes after the first product you choose to prosecute. I've also made money in a platform and a product. So I've had lots of wonderful exits, most recently in a company 
um, Corvidia that sold to Novo. On, you know, we, we had some backup programs and so on, but it was fundamentally one product that was just doing something important. My, I generally do platform companies, but I don't exclusively do it. I try not to bring religious fervor to any of my decision making. I think one, one last, sorry, Alex, I'm going to say one last thing, which is I think hypothetically the reason investors will often tell you they like platforms is that the cost to stand up a second program should in principle be lower than the cost of that first program, whether that's for target discovery or for modality design or for clinical studies. Yeah, exactly. And so I don't know if that is always empirically the case, but if you can make a really good argument to that effect, that is the underlying reason people have been attracted to platforms. Historically, it's a little bit like in the healthcare world, you know, a CAC argument. Like once you get your first, is it going to cost more or less to get to acquire your next customer? It's, a, it's sort of a similar thought process as to why, why investors like platforms in, in principle. All right, final word to you, Alex. Oh, just, well, there's a continuum of how platformy you are, right? And I like to look at companies on that spectrum. You know, if you are fully, like you're an antibody discovery platform, right? You just, how, how productive or how much output can your platform deliver? Or are you really, when you actually, they call it a platform, you really have a stack rank list of discoveries and the top few are really good and everything below that is junk. That's not, re it's kind of on the platformy spectrum that's sort of, not so platformy. So there's a continuum and it is nice to have optionality, especially in this market, if you can do provide lots of value without taking on lots of risk, binary risk with a particular clinical program, let's say, that's a good position to be in. All right, let's congratulate these VCs. You see what I did there? Well, congratulations for you all. Yeah, You're doing the hard stuff. Congratulate the entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah.